Hi everyone and welcome to Unit 15 where we're going to talk about the nematodes. The nematodes include free-living roundworms and other species dependent on a host. This is just one class of several multicellular worms that we're going to talk about and they are referred to as the helminths. The helminths would include the nematodes, which are the roundworms, the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, and the trematodes, which are the flukes and schistosomes. As always, know the infective and diagnostic stages how a person becomes infected, if they have a lung phase, and the intermediate host if applicable. So the nematodes are also referred to as the roundworms. The bodies are round like an earthworm and they are not segmented like an earthworm is. They do have separate genders, okay? The smaller one usually has a hooked tail and that's the male and the larger worm is usually the female and has no hooked tail and that's especially true with Ascaris, okay? They have a complete digestive tract and reproductive tract, and many are free living away from the host, okay? For example, um, human roundworms or pathogens, they're always dependent on a human as being their definitive host, and that is the host that harbors the sexual stage in the development of the nematode. So here I want to discuss how humans get infected with roundworms, okay? They can either ingest them so they can eat the ova, there can be larval penetration into the skin. An example of that is when the hookworms um, get into your skin via larval penetration between the webbing of your toes. And then finally, uh, larva can be transmitted from the bite of an insect through the bite of an insect vector. There are several methods of attachment that the roundworm connects to the host. Some do not attach at all and they are in constant motion. Many nematodes don't attach to the host and they are in constant motion such as Ascaris and Enterobias species. Some don't attach and are in constant motion. Then, we, then there are some worms that have mouth structures. Hookworms can attach to the host by teeth or cutting plates. And then finally, we have tissue penetration. Then we have trichinella that can become encapsulated inside the muscle tissue via what's known as a nurse cell. Here, let's go ahead and discuss the life cycle of nematodes. Always know the, know the diagnostic stage, the infective stage, the means of acquisition of parasite for the exam. Be able to recognize ova and in some cases larva, especially with the cestodes. Okay, so in the life cycle of the nematodes, and this is kind of a generalized life cycle, we have an adult worm that can live in the small intestine of the host. The female lays eggs which are passed with feces. The environment becomes contaminated with human or animal feces and the feces harbors the ova. Ova can be seen in the feces and that's the diagnostic stage. Larva start to develop inside of the ova, and there's actually two types of larva. A first stage larva is called the rhabditiform larva, which is the feeding non-infective larval stage. And then we have a third stage larva known as the filariform, which is the non-feeding infective stage that penetrates the skin. In step five, humans will ingest the developing ova or larva, um, or else the larva will penetrate the host skin, and that's the infective stage. The larva hatch inside the intestine of the host and the female begins to lay eggs in the intestine. So that's kind of a generalized life cycle of the nematodes. Let's discuss the pathogenicity of the nematodes. Nematodes are actively modal and they migrate through the body tissues and pierce intestinal and respiratory walls. They can be voracious bloodsuckers. For example, they can remove blood and nutrients from the host. An example of that would be with hookworms. Many humans have serious allergic reactions to roundworms and some have a horrible immune response to roundworms as well. One type of concentration technique that we'll use for helminth ova is sedimentation. It's a little bit better than flotation because the large ova can be heavy and will not float to the top. Don't forget that sedimentation in that concentration method we use formalin and ethyl acetate. Okay, the nematode helminth ova are very large at about 25 to 150 microns and they have a hard heavy shell so they do sink in the case of flotation. So sedimentation is the better option for concentrating these samples. So let's now go ahead and take a look at each specific type of uh, roundworm, okay? You do need to know the scientific and common names for these roundworms.
okay? I first want to start with Enterobias vermicularis, which is also known as the pinworm. This is the most common roundworm in the United States, and there's about 20 to 40 million people in the U.S. that are infected at any given time. This is distributed worldwide, and the entire life cycle occurs in man. It is not found in other animals. This is usually diagnosed with what's known as the pinworm paddle. This is a sticky paddle that is touched to the anus and will pick up the ova and then it will, it will be viewed microscopically for ova. We may be, these may be seen in um, fecal samples as well, but that is rare. Usually instead we want to use a pinworm paddle. Auto reinfection is common. The ova are laid in the perianal region and the female dies and the larvae hatch and re-enter the GI tract through the anus. So it is auto reinfective. And then here is some pictures of some adult pinworms. They're not very, very large at all. And you can see that this pinworm has a, a rear that looks like a pin. And then the, um, the mouth of the pinworm is, is toward the right in that right hand picture. Um, it has what's known as paraoral ali, which are wings. Okay. These are about 18 to 13 millimeters in length or about a half an inch long. Let's take a, a look at the life cycle of Enterobias vermicularis. The ova are ingested by the human or inhaled and that's the infective stage. The ova hatch inside the small intestine where they mature and the adults live inside the colon. The female migrates to the perianal region of the human and lay, lays her eggs there. The female can lay up to 10,000 ova a day, which is kind of crazy. The ova develop around the perianal region and infective in, and are infective in about four to six hours. The diagnosis stage is when you find ova on the pinworm paddle from the anal region. The ova are distributed to others by aerosols. Okay, so let's take a look at a picture of the Enterobias vermicularis on the next slide. So these are the ova of um, the pinworms and the pinworm ova are about 50 to 60 microns in length and about 25 microns in diameter. They usually have one flat side. They have a thick shell that may, you may be able to see the developing larva inside of this, the shell. Some, some symptoms of this disease would be kind of a restless uh, nature. Maybe the child that has pinworms could be irritable. They could have an upset tummy. And probably the number one symptom is an itchy butt. So if you see a child running around scratching their butt, it is possible that they have pinworms. The next roundworm I want to talk about is Ascaris lumbricoides, also known as the giant intestinal roundworm. This is the second most common gastrointestinal helmet in the United States. Approximately 1 billion people have this worldwide at any given time. They're called the giant intestinal roundworm because they can be up to 35 centimeters in length or up to a foot in length, and they do resemble an earthworm. They are the largest of the intestinal nematode, and they thrive in the small intestine, especially the lumen of the small intestine. The female may lay up to 200,000 ova a day, and the male larva can be identified because it's a little bit smaller and has a hooked tail. These are very active migrators. In fact, they get agitated very easily when they're attempted to be treated with drugs, and they move about the body very actively. Some symptoms of an Ascaris infection would be things like fever, cough, GI or respiratory blockages, and increased eosinophils. Let's take a look at the life cycle of Ascaris lumbricoides in the next slide. The infective ova with partially developed larvae inside are ingested by the human. That's the infective stage. These ova have developed in the environment or in the soil. We are infected by hand to mouth or by eating unwashed or raw vegetables or contaminated water. The larva hatch in the small intestine. The larva then penetrate the intestinal wall, entering the bronchioles, lungs, and or the liver or blood vessels. The unembryonated ova are passed in human feces and can be seen microscopically. And that would be the diagnostic stage one, finding the ova in human feces. Diagnostic stage two would be finding mature larvae that are either coughed up in the sputum or swallowed and passed in the stool. The fertilized ova can stay viable in moist soil and 5% formalin for years. Let's take a look at some pictures of the Ascaris lumbricoides ova.
On the left, there's a picture of an unfertilized Ascaris lumbricoides ova. You can see that it's about 80 microns in length, and they are more elliptical in shape than a fertilized ova. They are bumpy and yellow and very thick, and they are yellow or brownish due to bile salts in the gastrointestinal tract. On the right-hand side, we can see a more rounded Ascaris ova, and that's because the egg is fertilized. Usually when they are rounded like this, they're about 45 to 60 microns in diameter. Like I said, they are round or elliptical in the fertilized stage, and they may be thick or thinner the closer they are to hatching. So they'll look a little bit thicker when they're newly fertilized, and they'll look a little bit thinner as they are closer to hatching, okay? And it does stain with iodine and bile salts. Here's a comparison of the tail on the male and the female Ascaris lumbricoides. You can see that the female is much longer than the male, and she does not have a hooked tail, whereas the male is much smaller and has a hooked tail in order to grab onto the female during roundworm copulation. And if you don't like wormy, gross things, you may not want to look directly at the next slide. Here we go. So Ascaris usually live in groups and they can be coughed up through the respiratory tract and that's kind of what's happening to this young man here. Um, they do have a lung phase and so not only can they be pooped out in the gastrointestinal tract but they can also be coughed up and can come through the oropharynx and nasopharynx. The next ova I want to talk about is Trichuris trichuria, which is the third most common intestinal nematode and helmet in the United States. Trichuris trichuria is the whipworm, and it resembles a whip with a thick posterior body forms the stock, and the thin anterior portion forms the lash. The whipworm is found in warm, humid areas of the world, including the southern United States, and the whipworm resides in the large intestine of the human host. It is usually embedded in the GI tract. They're not very long. They're only about three to five centimeters long for the adult worm, and the ova is easily identifiable in the feces. They kind of look like a turkey platter, or they can be barrel-shaped with a transparent polar plug at each end and have a brown pigment. They're usually about 22 by 50 microns in length and diameter. Let's take a look at the life cycle of Trichuria trichuria. In this life cycle, the infected ova with developed larvae inside are ingested by the host. The ova is swallowed by man and the ova migrates to the large intestine and develops to adulthood in about three months. It snugly attaches to the intestinal wall and it can be tough to treat. The larvae hatch in the small intestine and further develop there. Adults attach to live in the colon and the ova are distributed there. The undeveloped lova, ova pass in the host feces and that's the diagnostic stage by finding the ova in feces. So here's a picture of a whipworm, and you can see there that the thick posterior body forms the stock, and the thin anterior portion forms the lash. Next, I want to talk about the hookworm. There's two types of hookworm, but their ova are virtually indistinguishable from each other. One type of hookworm is called the New World hookworm, which is Nicator americanus, and that is seen in the southern U.S. and Central America. The Old World hookworm is Ankylostoma duodenale, and that's usually a hookworm seen in Europe, Africa, China, and Japan. The hookworms actually attach themselves to the mucosa of the small intestine by either cutting plates, seen in the Nicator genus, or by teeth, seen in Ankylostoma genus. It's usually diagnosed by finding the ova in feces. Rarely you might see a rhabditiform larva, that's the feeding non-infective form, and if you see a larva, usually it is a larva that has a long buccal cavity. The buccal cavity, of course, is the mouth. Okay, These two ova, the New World hookworm and the Old World hookworm ova, are indistinguishable from one another. They're pretty large at 50 to 60 microns in length and about 36 to 40 microns in diameter. Inside of the ova shell, you can see the developing larva um, easily noted there, and you can see that the shell is thin and there's a clear space between the developing larva and the ova shell. Let's take a look at the life cycle of hookworms.
The method of infection is the filariform larva penetrates the skin of the host. Filariform just basically means infective non-feeding larva, but that is the infective stage. Usually the filariform larva penetrates between the fingers and toes of our, our other skin folds. Um, this particular worm, the hookworm, can only live without a host in the environment for about two weeks or then they will die. Aww. The larva enters the lymphatic system and the lungs and the larva are coughed up, swallowed, and returned to the intestine. Adults live in the small intestine where they produce ova. The ova are shed in the feces of the host and that's the diagnostic stage when you find the ova in the feces. Fecal material containing ova with rhabditiform larva develop in the environment. They molt twice and become infective filariform larva. Remember that rhabditiform larva is the non-infective feeding larva. Let's take a look at ankylostoma um, on the next slide. Here we can see an adult ankylostoma hookworm. The adults are about 5 to 13 millimeters long or about 400 micrometers. Okay. They are voracious blood suckers and you can lose up to 100 milliliters of blood per day leading to iron deficiency anemia. On the bottom right we can see the adult worms. Strongyloides stercoralis is also known as the threadworm, and they're pretty large at about 380 to 400 microns in length. They are a little bit different than the hookworm ova because here we, they have a short buccal cavity, and they are different than a pinworm ova because they have no wings by the buccal cavity. Strongyloides is found in the tropics and subtropics. The ova resemble a hookworm ova, but usually what we're looking for in this case is larva in feces. Autoinfection is common with this nematode. Hookworm ova have a long buccal cavity and plates or teeth. They can actually develop to filariform larva, which is the infective stage, in the human intestine and reinfect. So the strongyloides, it has a short buccal cavity, okay? Um, and they're about 380 to 400 microns in length. Let's go ahead and compare enterobias to strongyloides adults in the next slide. So here on the top, I've got an enterobias vermicularis, the pinworm, and it has a pin-like tail, and then it has a long buccal cavity, um, and usually it has those wings by the mouth. In the case of strongyloides, you're going to see a short buccal cavity, which is just a short mouth, and an hourglass-shaped esophagus. You can sometimes see what's known as a genital notch um, on the strongyloides worm as well. Keep in mind, strongyloides has no wings and a short buccal cavity, whereas the pinworm has paraoral wings and a long buccal cavity. Let's take a look at the life cycle of strongyloides. So the adults live in the small intestine, and females release their ova that hatch in the intestinal mucosa. The ova hatch in the GI tract, and the female is capable of unisexual reproduction, so there's no fertilization required. Rhabditiform larvae are passed in the feces into the environment, or they will cause auto-reinfection. This is the diagnostic stage by finding the rhabditiform larvae in the feces. So here we're not looking for the ova, we're actually looking for the larva. In step three, filariform larvae from the environment or from being auto-infected penetrate the skin and enter the lymph and blood systems. That's the infective stage when the filariform larva actually punctures the folds of the skin, okay? Um, or or you, it enters the lymph or blood system, okay? The larvae migrate to the lungs and are coughed up in sputum or swallowed and then returned to the intestine. Some symptoms of strongyloides would be peptic ulcers, diarrhea, and cough. Let's take a look at Trichinella spir spiralis. This is also known as a condition um, called trichinosis, okay? This is a condition seen worldwide among meat-eating populations. The principal reservoir for humans is the pig. Also, the principal reservoir can include bear and deer meat. There's usually only about 100 cases per year in the United States. The intermediate host in this life cycle is the pig.
Humans are not the usual traditional host, so the life cycle is not completed in the human. Instead, what we see is a nurse cell seen in the infected human. There is no egg or ova stage seen as humans are an accidental host. You can see there on the right a coiled larva inside of the nurse, nurse cell in striated muscle tissue. And how you would see this is by looking at muscle tissue and you would see the nurse cell. In the life cycle of Trichinella spiralis, the human ingests undercooked pork, deer, or bear, and that's the infective stage. Pork meat is digested and the larva within is released into the intestines of the human where it matures. The adult female is in the intestine and releases larva into the bloodstream where they disseminate and insist in the human muscle. Nurse cells are seen in the muscle tissues and that's the diagnostic stage. Some symptoms of trichinella or, or trichinosis would be deep muscle pain, diarrhea, difficulties with fine motor skills like talking or walking, and painful eye movement. Now I want to talk about the filaria, also known as microfilaria. These are the blood and tissue roundworms. The microfilaria require an arthropod intermediate host, okay? So let's talk about the anatomy of the filaria, okay? Usually you will see a sheath, which is kind of a thin eggshell, a cephalic space, which is a space between the sheath and the nuclei, excretory and anal pores, and nuclei and tail section. You might want to check out nuclear and tail morphology differences among species um, on Google or maybe in a textbook. The habitat would be on the lymphatic system and connective tissue and the microfilaria appear in the blood. Microfilaria actually means living embryo. Now there are clinically important filaria such as Wuchiria bancrofti. Um, there's also Loa Loa. There is Brogia mali and also Oncocerca volvulus which is the blinding filaria. So let's talk about all of these filaria. The first microfilaria I want to talk about is Bancroft's filaria, also known as Wuchiria Bancrofti. This is one that is seen in the tropics and subtropics and it requires an intermediate vector which happens to be the Anopheles mosquito. Now there are there is some speculation that other intermediate vectors could be the Culex or Aedes uh, mosquito as well, but for now we're just going to say it's the Anopheles mosquito. The larva enters through the mosquito bite wound and we would examine peripheral blood smears for diagnosis. They are very large and noticeable in peripheral blood smears with right stain. All filaria, and you can see this in the image, have a ribbon-like body and some have an exterior sheath with different nuclear patterns. And that's how we identify the microfilaria, is by looking to see if our organism has a sheath and how many um, nuclei will extend to the tail of the microfilaria. So for Wuchiria, the parasite invades the lymphatics and causes granulomas, lesions, chills, fever, eosinophilia, and eventual elephantiasis. And that's what's in the picture on the right, is a condition of elephantiasis. Loa loa is the African eye worm. It may be seen crossing the conjunctiva of the eye. The adults actively migrate through the subcutaneous tissues and that's why you're able to see them in the eye. Loa loa is seen in regions of Africa and the intermediate vector is the mango fly. We want to examine the peripheral blood smear for evidence of microfilaria. And again, it's going to look like these ribbon-like worms in the peripheral blood smear. Loa loa invades the subcutaneous tissues and blood and causes a chronic and benign disease of the conjunctiva. And th there's a reason why they call it the African eye worm. Here what I've done is I've compared Wuchiria bancrofti to Loa loa. You can see that they're both sheathed, um, but in the case of Wuchiria, they have nuclei that do not extend all the way to the tip of the tail. In Loa Loa, it is sheathed as well, but nuclei do extend to the tip of the tail. So symptoms of area would be fever and an enlarged lymph node or lymph nodes. And some symptoms of Loa Loa would be vertigo, achy limbs, and abdominal pain.
Let's take a look at the life cycle of the filaria. Microfilaria are ingested by the intermediate host where they develop into the infectious stage. Infective larvae enter the human through the skin wound of a biting insect. The larvae migrate and develop in the human tissues, in the lymphatics and subcutaneous tissues. And then finally, microfilaria migrate and can be seen in the peripheral blood smear. That's the diagnostic stage. Okay, so today we've covered quite a few nematodes. There's one other miscellaneous nematode I'm just going to mention because everyone always asks me about it. This is a nematode called the guinea worm, which is Dra Draconculus medinensis, which is Latin for infection with little dragons or Latin for fiery serpent. The guinea worm is a worm that you see commonly in Sudan, Mali, and Ethiopia. This is the worm that is often being seen wound around a matchstick from a burning wound ulcer. So that is it for the nematodes. Today we talked about pinworms, giant intestinal roundworms, and all kinds of good stuff. If you have any questions, please reach out to me and have a great day.